this is the third week that I've spoken to those of you who've committed yourselves to prayer. I feel it's very vital that we help you in this. And again, I want to focus your thoughts on love. You see, you can't even pray effectively unless you pray in the love of Jesus. That's the key. And that's true for all of us in our prayer lives. If we're praying with anything but love, we're not praying powerfully. We're not praying eternally. For everything that you do and everything that I do as a Christian believer is effective because we do it in His love. Now, I want to take you back a little way for a start to the words that Jesus gave us. It's in Matthew 22 verses 37 to 39 and Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I was listening to Charles Stanley expounding this and he did a magnificent job. And he pointed out that our love has to be in three directions if it's going to be total full love. First of all, it has to be the love for God with all our heart and soul and mind. We've got to love God with our whole being and then love our neighbor. But also, we have to love ourselves. And this sounds strange because Jesus said some other things about that. And we'll come on to that in a moment. Now to see this thinking about love, I want to take you back to Ephesians that I read to you earlier this evening. Ephesians chapter 3 and the second part of 17 where the Bible says this. And I pray that you being rooted and established or grounded in love may have the power to gather with all the saints. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus Christ. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then Paul goes into this incredible doxology. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church. And in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's go back to verse 17 in the second part. And the basic necessity of His love in our lives. The Bible says, you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and established in love. Is this you here tonight? As you walk with Jesus Christ each day. As you seek to be like Him, are you rooted and grounded in His love? That's the key. And if you're not, your Christian walk isn't effective. It simply can't be. This is the absolute basis for every one of us. This is what we need. So how do we become rooted and grounded in love? First of all, by my acceptance of Jesus Christ. As Lord and Savior. That's the starting place. Friend, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not even in this. You're not a Christian believer yet. You may believe that Jesus Christ lived and died, but you're not a Christian believer until you yourself take Him into your life as your Lord and Savior. You say, Richard, I go to church. Good. I go to Mass. Good. But that doesn't do it. It is your personal faith in Him. And once I accept Him, then I begin to be rooted in love. Because when I'm rooted in Him, I'm rooted in the source of all love. For the Bible says, God is love. And the moment you and I sin, we cut ourselves off from God, we cut ourselves off from love. And the Bible says, Every one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. So in that sin, we cut ourselves off from God. We're in our sins and we never get back until we come to Jesus. Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. And you say, well Richard, I go some other route. There is no other route. You know of the claims of Jesus Christ. There's only one way for you to go. And that's with Him.
The second thing is, by my acceptance of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I have a foundation of my walk in faith. And there's no other foundation to build on. You may get into all sorts of other areas. That's fine. But you've got to have the basis. The second thing I found was this. If I'm to be rooted and grounded in love, I do so by a growing knowledge of his life and his love. We can experience his love through other people. We had in one of our Bible study groups a need. One of our friends had been off sick. And they're in the sort of job that when they're off sick, they don't get paid. So I mentioned it to the group. And I finished up with getting on towards $200 for that person. They came to me. They said, how can I accept it? I said, you'd rather be giving it, wouldn't you? I said you're accepted in the way in which it was given. With love. You see, when you're in the family of God, that's how it is. They don't know. They just love you. And it's always the people who don't have any who give it. Isn't it great? That's the love I'm talking about. It's expressed in that way. But also, I have my love increasing in a growing knowledge for him. And if I don't have a growing knowledge of Jesus Christ. My love doesn't grow. And it's a growing relationship. You can tackle this any way you like. But if you talk about the power of Jesus in your life. You talk about the love of Jesus in your life. The peace of Jesus. Go through the whole thing. It's all dependent on my growing relationship with him. It's you and Jesus. It's me and Jesus. It's us. Just the two of us. And from that everything else flows. And if as you sit here tonight. You don't have a growing relationship in Jesus Christ. You don't have a growing strength. And you don't have a growing knowledge of him. You don't have love growing and increasing in you. You've got to work on that relationship. You say how? Spend time with him. Talk to him a lot. Bring Jesus into every part of your life. Into every activity of your life. Read about him. Learn about him. Share with others who know him. But you've got to be built up. The third thing I found was this. To be rooted and grounded in love. I have to do so by accepting God's love for me. Now, if I'm to accept God's love for me, for some of us, won't be all of us, I've got to get rid of any fear of God. It's a sad fact, isn't it? Some of us grow up from childhood fearing God. Fearing God, our loving Heavenly Father, who just wants to put His arms around us and love us. And we're afraid. We were trained to be afraid. By wrong doctrine. By wrong teaching. By well-meaning people who are misguided. And until I get rid of those fears, I can't love my God. I'm afraid of Him. Remember what the Bible said. Perfect love casts out fear. And the second thing there is, I must learn to love myself. Do you remember what I just read to you from Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now Jesus says elsewhere, deny yourself. Jesus says elsewhere, your love for me must be so great that your love toward your family is as hatred. He doesn't say you hate your family. He says your love, your obedience, your loyalty to me is so fantastic. It is so great that in comparison, any other love is like hatred. Now you say, now just a minute Richard. How do I love myself? You sit down and you see what God thinks about you. First of all, he created you. Secondly, he loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. The third thing you find is our God wants to fellowship with you. He wants to spend time with you. And he wants you to spend time with him.
This is how much He loves us. Once you begin to see that, you know how worthwhile you are to Him. And some of you may have gone through life where parents made you feel unaccepted. Or you got married and a loved one made you feel unaccepted. But in God, you've been accepted before the foundation of the world. He's always loved you. And He's just longed for you to come to Him and begin to love Him. Isn't that great? Do you hear what I'm saying? This is the gospel. Our God created us to love Him. He let Jesus die on the cross so that we can love Him. And when you begin to do that, you begin to love yourself. And the third thing I found was this. I've got to get any rejections cleaned up. If you've been badly rejected in your life, if you've been badly hurt through rejection, friend, you can't love. You don't love yourself. You can't let your love go to anyone else. You can't even love God. And so he comes along and by his Holy Spirit he begins to fill you with his love and heal the rejection. And if you're here tonight and you've been a very rejected person let me tell you free of charge you need the help of another Christian brother or sister to be prayed for to be loved to be healed. And you'll never love until you have that help. Or you say, Richard, I can pray on my own. Of course you can, but you're not going to get the healing. Because you're terribly subjective about yourself. You spend so much time with you, don't you? You need someone else to come from an objective point of view and say, yes, let's pray. And we have seen the Lord our God come in and set people free from those rejections and hurts. Sometimes from little people, sometimes older people, sometimes in their married life where a marriage is broken up, where a loved one's had an affair. They feel so rejected, they hate themselves. And Jesus comes in and he fills them with his love. And he heals them. The second thing I think we've got to learn is the immensity of God's love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice what it says here. It says, may have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. To really appreciate how great our God is, is to see how great His love is. For He is love. I need a power to understand beyond my own mind. For by my mind, I restrict God. You just try it. You say, Richard, when did God begin? Well, he began a way back before that. He always has been. But you say, just a minute, I can't take that in. That's right. Our human finite minds can't understand it. And I've got to have the Holy Spirit to help me to see the greatness of my God. He is so great. And his love is so great. And I think many of us just sort of tickle the surface. We don't understand how great our God is. You look up one night when it's clear, as it was at the beginning of this week, and you look at those stars. The moon was magnificent. You look at those stars. Millions of them. This is only one galaxy. And there are galaxies upon galaxies. We don't know how many there are. And our God made them all. And we come to him with a little prayer. Lord, do you think you can handle this one? Yeah, he says, I think I can. And we come to him and say, Lord, could you give me a little love? He said, you want to try mine? He is so great and we never see it. I need the Holy Spirit to reveal to me the greatness of my God and the greatness of his love for me. And I've got to recognize that his love is not exclusive to me. It's not even exclusive to Jesus' focused ministry. Did you hear what Paul said? To grasp with all saints, everybody who believes in Jesus Christ, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus Christ. The second thing he says here is, to know this love of God in Jesus that surpasses knowledge. You say, now just a minute, Paul, what are you saying? One minute you say to know it, 
And the next minute you say, it surpasses knowledge. Well, I know this. I will never finally fully understand the love of God while I'm here on earth. I'm too limited by my humanity. I'm too limited by this body, this mind. I just can't grasp it. I also know there will be a time in the future when I go to be with him. And in that moment, I will grasp for the first time the greatness, the immensity of his love. But here on earth I won't. I haven't got the capacity. Also, I know this. If I'm to know this love that surpasses knowledge, I've got to continue to grow in my knowledge and understanding of Him and of His love. I've got to continue to grow in Him. I mustn't ever stop. What have you done this week to help your growth in Jesus? We say, Richard, I've had such a busy week. Well, try next week. Because I think he'll be back soon and you'll still be waiting to try. Also, I must always know that Jesus is available for me. Which takes me to this. It says we're to be filled with the full measure of the fullness of God. Filled with a measure of the fullness of God. What does that mean? I believe this. It's the fullness of God's love in me. And the interesting thing about love is, the more you give away, the more you get. And he goes on pouring his love into us, filling us with that love. Because that's him. That's who he is. We are to be filled with a measure of the fullness of God. Also, when I'm filled with his love, other things can't get in. Which means filling with his love is a block to sin that tries to come into my life as it tries to come into yours. It's a block to criticism. I don't know if you have a critical spirit. Maybe you do. But if you're a critical sort of person, let the love of God begin to fill you. You can't be critical if you're filled with his love. And if you're one of these negative souls, we have a few in Jesus' focus. Everything's negative. You listen to them. Everything's negative. It doesn't matter what's happening. There's always something negative. What do they need? They need this fullness. This measure of God's fullness in them. Filled with their love. And once his love fills them, that negativity has to go. And they sneeze that all over the place. Be careful. Also notice, he wants to fill me with his joy. He wants to fill me with the desires of my heart. He wants me to have pleasure in Him. He wants me to begin to live in His fullness. This is what Jesus says when He says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Are you living an abundant life? Every so often we find one of our Christians who's up today, down tomorrow. One I saw this week in a Bible study in the evening, high as a kite, out in the Holy Spirit, and the next morning, oh, uh-uh. Begin to flatten it out, gang. Not all this roller coaster living. Let Jesus bring to you the measure of the fullness of God and His love. And then the next thing I found was this it's this doxology which I just think is superb. Verses 20 and 21. Verse 20, part A. The incredible work of our God. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. You don't really understand God and nor do I. We don't really understand his ways. We don't fully understand his thinking. We get glimpses here and there and the Holy Spirit reveals something here and the word of God reveals something there. But we don't really understand it. And what we often do is come to God with our worldly, humanistic thinking and say, Lord, isn't this great? He says, that's great, but that's not the way I want to do it. And remember that you get four answers to your prayers. He says, yes. He says, no. He says, wait. And he says, yes. But we'll do it my way. And that's the one you don't like, isn't it? Yes, but we'll do it my way. Oh Lord! You see, it's like Peter washing the disciples' feet. 
Jesus comes to him. You'll never wash my feet, Lord. All right, you have no part with me. Jesus begins to move. Oh, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head, the whole thing. Peter, hold it. Why don't you let Jesus do what he wants to do? Why don't we let God work his own way? Why do we always think that we can work it out so much better? He can do immeasurably more than we can even think or ask. That's our God. Anything beyond that we can ask. The Bible says ye have not because ye ask not. Our requests are so small and our God is so great. And we often miss the blessing. Beyond anything we can imagine. Now stop a minute. Think of something great for God to do. And know that he can do that and far more beside. Whatever you're thinking of. The Bible says he can do far greater than that. And I found a little hymn verse that says this. For the love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind. That's right. The love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind. But also, Paul says this. Second part of that verse. According to his power that is at work within us. His work is by His power. We're thinking about God, our God, and He is the creator of all things. He's the ruler of all things. And do you know what we do in the church? We try to please the world. We try to fit in with the world's systems. You can't do it. They're going in that direction and we're going in that direction and we're going up to him and they're going somewhere else. And with all their humanistic ideas, the church tries to be the same. You can't. You don't want to be. We are on a totally different path. We're to a different Lord. The humanist says, it's to man. The Bible says, it's to God. Which way are you traveling? Which way does your thinking go? Do you think as the world or do you think as Jesus? And it can be difficult. This is not easy. And remember, it's his work by his power. What does that mean? His power is the power that brought Jesus back from the dead. His power is the power that's conveyed by the Holy Spirit into your life and into mine and into the church. And remember, the Father and Son in you is the Holy Spirit. The Father and Son in your church is the Holy Spirit. That's the power. And when we were praying with those friends, we could feel the power moving. That's the Holy Spirit. That's our God at work. For He is sovereign. Also notice, he finishes by saying, His glory in the church, the body, His people. He says here, To Him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. God's glory is seen in the church when the church loves. When the church loves. Let's go back to that little scene that I mentioned. You see, there's glory in Jesus' focused ministry when Jesus' focused ministry loves. And when we don't, the glory's gone. In that scene, when Jesus has washed their feet, he sits down, Judas leaves, and he begins to teach. Let me read to you what he said. Incredible. John 13 and verse 34. A new commandment I give you. Listen. Love one another. He's not talking to the world at this point. Just 11 disciples. He's talking to you. And he's talking to me. Love one another. And then he goes on. And he says this. As I have loved you. So you must love one another. All men will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another. There's a little problem here. In fact, there are two problems. First of all, we're all different, aren't we? 
Don't you believe me? Look round. Aren't we all different? Isn't that great? Now says Jesus, my commandment to you in the Shamley Warwick Presbyterian Church this Friday evening is to love one another. How Lord? As I love you. Wow. How did you love us Lord? To the end? With patience? In spite of your differences? Even to death? That's what he said. And he says the world won't even know that you're my disciples unless you have love for one another. Each of us loving as Jesus has loved us. And our glory is only in him. It is not in ourselves. It is not in our abilities. It is in him. It's always in Jesus. That's our glory. My love for him must continue to grow day by day if I'm really to be a prayer partner. And notice this. May his love flow through this sanctuary tonight and fill us. May it always fill our conversations. May it always flow in our Bible study groups. And our Friday evening services. Because it is in and through that love. That he's glorified. And it's in and through that love. That we're healed. Let's pray. Father. Some of our friends need this love so much at this moment. They're hurting. They're confused. They're depressed. And some are physically sick. And everyone needs that love that we've talked about. I pray that first of all that you pour that love out. Into and through each one of us. And then I pray also that everyone in this sanctuary. May become rooted. And grounded in that love. And begin to see how great it is. We say thank you Jesus.